Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Whitwam Organics Weekly Nursery and Garden Report. My name is David Whitwam, and I'm your host. Thank you so much for joining me. I am so excited about today's episode. I have Rob Clemens on. Um, anybody who knows Rob knows what a big deal that is to get him in front of a camera. <laughs> um, but we're going to be, uh, he's out there at his farm right now, uh, Bob's Berries. Um, he's going to give us a little tour. Uh, and then he's going to go inside and we're going to sit down. We're going to have a little chat about blueberries, uh, the care for fruit trees, um, talk about his upcoming events. Um, it's going to be a really exciting show today. But before we uh, meet Rob and, and see his farm, I want to tell you guys a little bit about what we have going on in our nursery. So as far as live plants go, we still have a pretty good amount of winter greens. If you don't have winter greens go growing uh growing yet, I would highly recommend getting plants and not seeds. This is for Central Florida. North Florida and up, pretty much everything else is still on the table. So we have uh, still have lots of arugula. We just finished, uh, well, let me go through the greens first. So we have arugula, um, spring uh, rapini, parasicaba Brazilian sprouting broccoli, uh, couple other types of broccoli, Chinese cabbage, regular cabbage, uh, purple and green, um, cauliflower, bunch of different kinds of chard. That's one of my favorite vegetables to grow. Um, does really well all winter and um, will carry well into the summer. I've even had chard make it two years uh, through our summer times. Um, collards, we have Portuguese collards, also called Portuguese kale or Portuguese cabbage. We have a Florida heirloom variegated collards. We also have Georgia collards. We just finished up planting a bunch of ducat dill. Um, we have a new eggplant, the Florida market eggplant, which is kind of a black beauty-ish uh, uh, Florida heirloom uh, eggplant. Uh, favorites of customers as well as myself, the Chinese bride. Those are those long white and purple ones. The shoyo long Japanese, which are the long dark purple ones. Um, kale, we have blue curl kale, lacinato kale, red kale, red Russian kale, Siberian kale. We also have Chinese kale or Chinese broccoli, which is a flowering kale. If you eat broccoli at a traditional Asian restaurant, it's probably this, uh, the Chinese broccoli or Chinese kale. Uh, kohlrabi, purple and green. I don't think it's too late to get that in. Um, Lettuces, we have our Jericho Romaine, which is extremely heat tolerant. We actually grow it all summer here. Um, Manoa head lettuce, that's from Hawaii. It's also very heat tolerant. We also have red deer tongue, um, green oak leaf, Cimarron Romaine. Um, again, if you've got a shady spot, I don't really feel like if you get starts, it's too late for lettuce. For the Jericho Romaine and the Manoa, if you're planning on trying to grow it, Further into spring and in the summer, I recommend seeds because the trick is just really planting a lot of seeds and harvesting your lettuce very young. So uh, Mizuna and Mabuna, which are kind of in the mustard family, they're extremely heat tolerant too. They do have some pest issues uh, this time of year, namely fungus gnats. So you got to keep an eye on that or the larva will eat the roots as it gets too hot. For mints, we have mojito mint, Vietnamese mint, and peppermint. Uh, mustard greens, we have the Florida heirloom, broadleaf mustard, we have red giant mustard, and Mike giant mustard. Um, our oregano is just now coming in. We got a little bit of red pak choy left. Parsley just got planted up. We uh, only stocked the Italian large leaf uh, parsley. That's what the chefs like to use. That's really the best one for cooking. Um, we just finished up planting our, so that's it for the wintry stuff. Um, we just finished up planting all of our peppers, tomatoes, new round of eggplants. Um, we have big red peppers, California wonder peppers. Um, I guess those aren't up yet. The tender bell, which are mini peppers, they're coming up. They'll be ready soon. Um, habanero peppers, jalapeno peppers, Thai bird peppers, Sage, I'm going to bring up the sage when I'm doing my garden report. Um, what else? Choho, that is a like a tatsoi. You can grow that well into the heat of spring and into the beginning of summer for sure. 
Um, time has just become available. Um, we grow it all from seed, so it, it takes time. <laughs> um, tomatoes, we have our beefsteak heirloom tomatoes. The Florida Dade Determinant Florida Heirloom Tomato, the Homestead Determinant Florida Heirloom Tomato, uh, Roma Tomatoes, we have those in a determinant and uh, the Italian Roma Heirloom, which is an indeterminate Roma. Um, just depends on, you know, determinants, you'll get all your tomatoes at once, indeterminants, they're more viney, but they'll put out uh, flushes. Uh, they're also one of the more heat tolerant ones. Cherokee Purple, brandy wine, Sweetie Cherry Tomatoes, and yellow pears. We're doing the yellow pears again. Um, the sun gold tomatoes will be ready in about two weeks. And then um, we're waiting on the Everglade tomato plants. Those will be ready in about another week. And we're still working on processing our seeds for the Everglade cherry tomato. That's been a popular item. Um, as far as in the gardens go, I just, the reason I brought it up, I just had to tear out a bunch of Mizuna and Mabuna out of one of my gardens. Um, I was monitoring them very closely and I could see the fungus gnats uh, in the bottom and the leaves were starting to look wilty. So I just chopped them all out. I'm gonna let that area sit for a little while, clean it up, put another round of those in in about a week and uh, treat for the fungus gnats because I already know that they're there. And I'll use the uh, Bacillus thuringiensis Israelis. I'm probably butchering that. I believe Paul Zimota is in the room, our Latin guy. Um, but it's B-T-I with small i. Um, and that is what's in mosquito dunks. That's what you really want for the larva of the fungus gnats. Regular BT won't work. Um, I know peroxide works, but we don't want to bleach out the uh, microbes that are in our soil. And I've also read that the conserve with spinosad in it also works. So I'll be kind of batting around with those, not the peroxide. Um, so yeah, um, we harvested a lot of lettuce. We're still harvesting tons and tons of lettuce in our gardens that are in, in, in full sun, y'all. Uh, broccoli still coming in strong. Cabbages, we're harvesting cabbages like crazy. Tomatoes are just starting to produce. Spinach with these heat waves, instead of my, my usual MO is when I plant spinach, I plant the seeds really thick. And then as the plants grow, I kind of do a negative harvest and pluck out entire plants when they're about four to six inches tall until I achieve proper plant spacing. That way I'm not wasting that space and we're eating baby spinach the whole time. Now that the plants were fully grown, we were just picking at the leaves. Well, with this last heat wave, the spinach was just looking rough. We've already eaten bags and bags and bags of it. Um, a lot of my gardens are just chocked full of stuff right now. So we're kind of clearing out rows of some of the winter stuff that's struggling right now to make room for some spring vegetables like the eggplants, tomatoes, squash, beans, cucumbers, uh, stuff like that. So um, we will have, oh yeah, we planted watermelon, which we have two new watermelons, by the way. We have the Florida Giant Watermelon, which is an heirloom, and then also the Jubilee. I'm really excited to give those a try. They're also available on the website by Seeds. We also have our Icebox Watermelon, which is a mini watermelon. It's also a smaller plant and it grows a lot faster. So if you're kind of new to watermelons or you're limited on space, I would recommend trying the Icebox Watermelon. Um, that's also available on the site, but all those, the seeds are coming up in the nursery. Um, we also got a new basil. So we've had the obsession, Rutgers obsession, downy mildew resistant basil for quite some time right now. I'm super happy with it, but it is a sweet basil, which is a little bit different than the new one we got, which is called devotion, which is also by Rutgers and is a downy mildew resistant variety of a Genovese basil. So it's got those bigger cup leaves, much more uh, uh, potent, but my, milder flavor, milder, milder, sharp basil flavor, but it does have a stronger flavor. I don't think I'm saying that right. The sweet basil is sharper. That's a better way to put it. Um, and the Genovese has that uh, just more aromic basil flavor. So we're gonna have both of those. Um, and hopefully the devotion proves to be just as amazing uh, downy mildew resistance 
Um, if you've ever had trouble growing sweet basil, that's your problem. So getting a downy mildew resistant variety is key. Um, the plants of the Obsession basil are now available online. Um, the Devotion will be ready in another couple weeks. Both are available right now by seeds and it's definitely the right time for you to be planting seeds. Um, things that I would recommend planting right now by seed out, out in the gardens, if you can find a carrot, we've got the um, cosmic purple carrots. <laughs> I had to think there for a second. The cosmic purple carrots are ready to harvest in 45 days for smaller carrots, and they're usually done in 60 to 65 days. That is a fast enough carrot to get them in right now and have another crop before it gets too hot. Hot. We also have our new Corotta tropical carrot, which you can pretty much plant all the way up until you can still get those darn things to germinate. I think they need soil temperatures below 78 degrees. So if you can get them to germinate, I've had them growing successfully all the way up until July. The only setback with those is they take 90 to 110 days. So that's usually my last carrot in, and then my in and and then after summer. That's my first carrot in. Um, beans, pole beans. We have blue lake pole beans by seed, tender green bush beans, burgundy bush beans. It's time to get all that stuff going. But it's also time, if you have a hunker in for it, to get any summer stuff going as well. So it's not too early for okra, lima beans, long beans, uh, the Jamaican sorrel or roselle. We've already got that going. It came up in like two days out, out there. Um, I think we're kind of at the tail end, but I don't really feel like it's too, too late uh, for corn and uh, potatoes. If you want corn and potatoes, if you're in Central Florida, you better get your butt out there and get those things going right now. If, you do, if you're doing potatoes this late, you're probably going to be harvesting them as like new potatoes in like 60 or 90 days. But you know what? They're potatoes. That's awesome. So... Um, so yeah, that's it for the nursery report. The garden report, like I said, the biggest pest I've been noticing is the fungus gnat larva on some of our winter greens in the garden beds. Uh, just something to keep an eye on. As these like hot, cold, hot, cold, we have noticed some aphid pressure, but really nothing bad yet. Um, oh, cat! Whew, how did I forget? In one of my gardens, and I barely ever get these, um, but we had vine borers on some of our yellow squash. So they're already out. That particular garden I'm talking about is up by the USF area. And we already have squash vine borers, took out a bunch of our plants before we realized it and began spraying with conserve and BT, conserve and BT. And now we're just going to have them on a regular uh, spray cycle. The reason I'm telling you guys all this is because I work in gardens all over the Bay Area. And most of the time when I notice one thing at one garden, I see it at the other gardens. So if I'm seeing problems, certain problems in my gardens, there's a really good chance that you should be keeping an eye out for that stuff in your gardens. So, um, so yeah, that's it. So Rob is actually out in um, his nursery right now. I'm going to introduce him. We're going to talk a little bit about Bob's berries, and then he's going to give us a little walking tour. Then we're going to go inside. He's going to have a seat, and we're going to talk a little bit more about blueberries and plants and all that stuff that I want to that I want to talk about. So, without further ado, Rob. Hello, everybody. How you doing, man? I'm awesome. So, Rob, I see we're looking at your blueberries right now. <laughs> yeah i don't know if you can tell but we've got some fruit coming in that's awesome mine are mine are mine have a lot of flowers on them right now so i'm looking out here mine are actually right out this window mine have a lot of flowers on them right now and some tiny blueberries but when you were showing me these earlier um i mean some of those blueberries look like they're getting close to full size and about to start turning colors uh, this particular variety will get about twice this size. It's a little bit earlier starting, uh, but that's because they're larger fruit. What is that variety, Rob? This is called Winter Bell. Okay. Uh, currently only available on the commercial U-Pick market, so it's not something that gotcha. 
you know, you'd be able to play with at home just yet, but. So that's nothing uh, that you eventually. can get plants of and sell in your nursery, correct? No, that's correct. Gotcha. Okay. So Rob, how many plants do you got there for your U pick? Uh, we are probably sitting on around 800 right now. Uh-huh. Uh, and we've got to do about 150 to 200 replants. Two, 150 to 250 replants? Yeah, so we're in the process of phasing out some really old plants. So, um, Rob, you know, what's, a really old, what's a really old plant? I'm just curious. Like, what's their lifespan? Yeah, if they're really healthy from the get-go, maybe 15 years on a okay. southern uh, These that were that are dying off are probably in the eight to nine year range. Uh huh. Uh, they're they're just in plastic pots, and I got them from a closing nursery uh, or a closing youth farm years and years ago. So, and what I, usually take what usually takes them out, Rob? Uh, most of the time, it's some sort of a infection and they start looking like this it's some sort of a what i'm sorry i didn't hear you some sort of an infection and i'm not really sure uh, and i've had uh, uf uh, come and look as well and i cannot remember what it was but it, they're not sure if it's spread uh, in the air or in the soil or from bugs basically the the deal is you see this, you got to cut it back and pray for the best. So there is a, so, so you cut them back and just kind of hope they re re sprout. Exactly. Gotcha. Um, so Rob, how long have you guys been doing this there? Uh, this year will be the sixth year that we've been open, uh, to the public. And like, how many years were you starting this out? Like building it out? Like what? Okay, so from conception to beginning construction to your first day open, how long did it take? Oh, eh, probably about two years. That's it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed by some of the, the starts you get, and when you put them out, how fast you get those plants up to size and running and pumping out berries for your you pick. Well, yeah. I mean, between the fertilizer that we get from you and uh, the compost teas that we're getting in from uh, <laughs> California, um, we're, we're seeing massive growth increase. I mean, this plant that we're looking at right here is two years old from a small plug. That's amazing. Uh, looking at about three to four years traditionally. So, Rob, what kind of blueberries do you have out there? Can you remember them all? Oh, yeah. So uh, this couple rows here in the beginning are Winterbell, and you'll notice they have a lot of green on them. These are an evergreen variety, so they don't shed their leaves in the winter like some of the other varieties do. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you can see here in this coloration, they will start to die off and fall off and then be replaced with, with new growth. Oh, that's interesting. The flowers and fruit have set. God, look at all that fruit. Yeah, yeah. This variety is supposed to projected uh, uh, do about ten to twelve pounds of fruit per plant. Uh, it's about four times of what a jewel or an emerald would produce. So, what other kinds of blueberries do you have out there? So these are Arcadias. These are brand new. We just planted last season. Uh, it's another commercial variety, very low chill, uh, with a an eight to nine pound production per plant um, so you can see these were just planted in uh, I would say October uh -huh. sometime uh, now I also want to point out that most people will tell you that you want to pick these flowers off on these young plants um, that's fine if you're growing one or two plants uh, but we've got a couple hundred here and I'm also force feeding them nutrients so there's really no no problem with them holding fruit even if it's 10 or 12 berries. So they'll, the plant itself will continue to grow just fine if it has ample nutrition, even if it's holding berries in its first or second year. Absolutely. Okay. So you got the Winterbell and the Arcadia. What else you got out there? 
these last couple rows here are older. These are jewels, emeralds, sapphires, uh, misty, um, and maybe one or two others. Hey, didn't you try some of those pink ones? Um, I did, and I did do not do? believe that they survived. They didn't survive? I do not think so, no. Uh, those are um, those are not a southern high bush. They're a, a rabbit eye variety. What does that mean, uh, Rob? What is a southern are, high bush blueberry, and what is a rabbit eye? Is that what you said? Rabbit eyes are traditionally grown in the northern regions. They, okay. they just they're very large plants, and they typically need a lot of chill time. Okay. Uh, what does I've that seen mean? some like, of those. I, I, so chill, chill hours, uh, for everybody who doesn't know, is temperatures, I believe, below 45, but not freezing. Correct. So Correct. The number of what hours. Is, below what is a lot of chill hours? So like my peaches um, need 150 to 200 chill hours, right? Like, but right. what's a lot? Uh, I just we're really talking hear how many chill hours these northern varieties need. We're talking 1,200 to 1,400 plus? Yeah, yeah. It's in the thousands. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, and those are also adapted to, to freeze completely in the winter, be covered in snow, et cetera, and then bounce back the following year. A lot and of them will, will live 60 to 80 years. Holy crap. So we have a completely different game going on down here. Completely different. Yeah. Go figure. It's Florida. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so like last year um you were just opening up kind of when the pandemic hit and we were on lockdown how did you do how did you get through that did you shut down um like what was your strategy during the pandemic because obviously you're not shut down right, right right um i mean we have fruit it has to be picked some way or another so we did uh, figure out a way that we could open uh, and have very limited quantities of people here. Uh, we set up an appointment system in our website uh, that would allow people to book a time slot and then have nobody else here when they were here. Um, that was really the only way we could we could do it. Now, are you guys time. still going to be doing something like that? Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, being able to walk around and talk to people about the plants. Uh, you know, it was kind of a big part of why I even started doing this. So uh, when we have a smaller groups of people here, it makes it much easier to do that. So, so I think we'll, we'll continue doing enjoy that. Enjoy your way. job. Exactly. Yep. That's nice. Um, I mean, but was there like a big drop in sales or did you still get all the berries picked? Like, do you think this might even be something you continue doing? Uh, yeah, we had a tremendous drop in sales and a lot of fruit that just fell off. It just, couldn't oh, get wow. yeah. And, and unfortunately with our blackberries, uh, that caused some, some pest problems that we hadn't experienced in the past. So what, like fruit flies and stuff, uh, the sucking insects that would, uh, that would attack the ripe fruit and spread bacteria from plant to plant. Can you walk over to your blackberries? I want to see them. Sure. So Rob grows these blackberries, y'all, that are like freaking boss. They're just they're huge. Um and his his setup is super cool. All in pots still, but he's got these guy wires set up. Well, you'll see. Yep, here we are. Just starting to grow out foliage right now. Now I'm so massive confused on my blackberries on like when to trim what and isn't there something with like the the vine from last year gets the vines on it with the berries or something like that so you can't just willy-nilly trim them anywhere or do you just trim them back every year and let them do their thing no no there's there's primocane and floricane so what that means is uh you know floricane is a is a cane that will flower and a primocane is a cane that will flower next year primocane so, primocane and floricane okay i'm typing that out to people who watch this later flora f-l-o-r-a 
Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Is it one word? Primacane. Yes. Primacane? Yeah, one word. Both of them. Correct. All right. I hope I don't butcher this, but I'm gonna put it up in the chat. And I'm gonna put it up on the screen so that people can. Um... All right. So primacane and fluorocane. And the primacane is which one? Uh, primacane is going to be fruiting next year. Oh, and fluorocane will be. Fruiting. Hang on, Paul gave me a, um. Paul fixed my spelling. Is he correcting me? He is being Paul that we are so thankful <laughs> for. <laughs> You gotta time out. Okay, so there we go. Here we go. So anyhow, Paul got it right. Primocane and fluorocane. I have fluorocane, right? You have primocane, most likely. Okay, so back to. I'm sorry. Now I'm paying attention. So primocane is the older stuff, and fluorocane is the newer stuff. Uh, yes, yes. Primocane is this year's growth. Fluorocane is this year's flower if that makes sense so say that again these will produce yeah. every year okay so so these plants will produce every year fruit what happens is they will grow out a, a number of canes and those canes that are grown this year will produce fruit next year the canes that had produced last or grown out last year produce fruit this year so they sort of alternate so once the cane is flowered you cut it all the way back. Can you show us an example of what you're talking about? I don't know uh, if we'll see it on the camera, but if we can, that would yeah, be awesome. So, so these, these two canes here flowered and fruited last season. They were mm -hmm. removed. Same thing with this guy here. These were removed, and all these shoots have grown up since then. Okay. This little guy right here will fruit next season. I don't even Most know likely. Why I'm there it's, we go. It's still okay. too small. So the interesting thing about blackberries is they, they kind of grow in reverse of how blueberries work. Uh, okay. So blueberries, you get your flowers first, typically, and then they will grow in all their foliage. Blackberries are the opposite. They'll get foliage first, and then they'll start popping flowers, as you can see. Nice. Flowers here. So these plants here are roughly two years old. Jesus. Uh, last year, we produced something like 600 pounds of blackberries. Oh, my God. Okay, so wait. How many plants is that? Uh, four, or five, can, six rows? If you can see these, there's only four rows. I only had three in production last season. <laughs> and there are 42 plants in a row. That's incredible. I would have thought because they're vining, you would need them further apart so they can just be right there on top of each other, huh? I guess because you cut them back every year. Yeah, we cut them back. I, I sometimes will will chase the the canes across and and intermingle, and they'll they'll root they'll root in here and start another plant. So can you uh, cut that black up and then berries. replant it for a new plant? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Typically, you would just, um, you would just cover it. You just cover it up a little, and it'll it'll root on its own. Once it does, how many you can, wires do you, you have above each row? Just the two? Is that what I'm seeing? Just the wires. Oh. Yeah, they're many, about three how foot many above. Wires? The, you got one on each pop. side. Is that it, or is there it, another row? Yep, just one on each wire. side. Uh, no, that's it. I actually intend to do another row uh, about halfway down eventually. Oh, so you need another but row of right wire now, lower, not higher. Lower, yeah. Yeah, to, to try okay. and kind of wrangle them into this V shape. Um, otherwise, I'm constantly picking them up off the ground and trying to feed them through. Uh, since gotcha. these don't have the kind of thorns or, or tins, they don't climb on their own. You kind of have to 
train them or, or force them to go where you want them. Um, do you have a preferred way? I think I see like little green things. Do you have a preferred way to tie them up that's the easiest on the plant? Uh, I, for these, I just used my tape gun, which is what we use to uh, to tape our trees okay. to the stakes. Um, gotcha. You want it to be sort of tight but still flexible and then not loose enough where it's going to rub and create lesions on the on the plant. Now, how are they with watering? I think I killed a couple of mine by not watering them enough. Um, I actually water them at the same frequency that I water my blueberries, about once every three days. Um, okay. You have the same kind of sprayers I do. So even though you have a bigger system, it would equate. So every three days, how many minutes? Uh, three minutes. Three minutes every three days. That's it. That's it. And these are four gallon per hour emitters. I want to say it takes us about 10 minutes to produce at each sprinkler head one gallon of water. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Those are the same sprayers I have. So, yeah, in, in three minutes, we're doing about a third of a gallon, give or take. Third of a gallon for the pots every three Now, does that need to be adjusted as you're moving into summer? Um, no, it stays the same all year round. Okay. Oh, that's good info. So, I think I've been watering my berries and my blackberries completely wrong <laughs> to this point. I mean, um, typically you, you should probably reduce them uh, in the in the winter time when they're dormant. But um, you know, since we're growing in the fabric pots, uh, they dry out anyway. So I try to keep them a little little wetter. Than most we'll get into those fabric pots when we go inside. I know we're losing light. Now, what kind of blackberries do you have out there? And are these also available for sale on your website? Uh, yes, they are. I have uh, Primark Freedom, uh, Osage, and Sweetie Pie. Three kinds? Three kinds. Well, and what's the difference between the three? Why do you have these three different kinds? Uh, well, at least two are needed for cross-pollination for better fruit production. Okay. Um, the third one, Sweetie Pie, just sounded interesting, so we threw them in. Uh, but the Prime, Prime Arc and the Osage are both very large berries and very sweet. Uh, so. I mean, do they all produce at the same time, though? Or are you getting a little bit of an offset season that's extending your season, or what? They virtually produce at the same time. The The Primarchs will sometimes produce in August a second crop, but it's very minimal compared to the summer crop. So can you pan back around, just do a complete 180? Yeah. Like turn, just turn around to down your driveway. I want everybody to see the trees that he has planted. Um, Rob... So we're going to, Rob, could you start making your way over to your nursery now? Yeah. So, so Rob not only has this you pick, y'all, he also has a nursery where he sells fruit trees. And he doesn't just sell the fruit trees. He also plants them all around on his property. So, so he's not just selling you stuff that he hasn't toyed with himself. So 99% so of the fruit trees that I use for my job, my installation come from Rob. Um, and and he has he has knowledge and experience of most everything that he stocks. Now you've got something right there in front of you, Rob, that has been a unicorn for the past year. What are those? These are Florida peach trees. Florida peach trees. Oh my God! I thought they didn't exist anymore. Uh, range from about 125 chill hours to about 175, depending on where you are. So. Those peach trees, what kinds do you got? Uh, Tropic Beauty, uh, Tropic Snow, Florida Grande, uh, Tropic Prince, and Florida Prince. Oh, wait. You don't have Florida King? I do not have Florida King. That's a joke. I have read so many posts over the past month of people buying the Florida King. It's for sale right now at all the tractor supplies all over Central Florida. The damn things need 600 chill hours. <laughs> and they're selling well, them at the 
tractor supply right down the road. Uh, I mean, they'll probably work great in Tallahassee and uh, the yeah. Panhandle. So, y'all, Florida peaches aren't all created equal. Florida's a giant state. They have peaches that are made for North Florida. They call Florida peaches. What's that? That is uh, lychee. Uh huh. I thought uh, it got. Um, did you just pull that out of your little gr make makeshift greenhouse thing? I thought it's been way too cold for those right now. I have not put this in my greenhouse at all this year. And it's alive. It is doing perfectly fine. Now, is that a special variety? I thought they were not that cold tolerant. Uh, I thought and I know you get degrees colder than me. It is hack ip. Well, you guys, I'm sold because you got some you you had to have gone down below freezing this year. Uh maybe once. Maybe once or twice. Once or twice. Because we got yeah. pretty close here in Seminole Heights in Tampa. Right. Yeah, it's been unusually warm this winter. Um, I mean, I've I've got basically everything here. Uh, didn't miss a beat. Barbados cherry, cinnamon, uh, kefir lime, bay leaf, bay rum. Pretty much bulletproof. Um, they've done fine. Yeah, even this tamarind here has never been inside the greenhouse, and it may have lost all of its leaves or most of them, but it'll recover just fine. So the other thing, um, you've got a bunch of mangoes. Is that what's in your greenhouse? Uh, greenhouse has mangoes and avocados and some some more cold sensitive, smaller, younger plants. Um, Jamaican cherry. Uh, black Suriname cherries only because they're they're very small still. Yeah. Um, some of this stuff doesn't really need to be in here. It just was in here whenever we started getting cold come through, and I just had to jam everything in. Have you and had so to run the heater yet? Kind of got stuck in the back. Uh, I ran the heater probably three or four nights. Man, I haven't been out there in a while, Rob. You were like kind of just getting that thing official and set up last time I was out there. That looks good. Yeah, it works pretty good. It looks really good. So you've got a lot of figs too, don't you? I do have a lot of figs. Your camera just um, went sideways again. Did we lose him? Rob, if you can hear me, I think you're frozen up. Well, that's what happens when you are filming live on a phone. Anybody who's watched any of my old videos back when I used to do it all on my phone, I got frozen up all the time. Rob, if you can hear me, um, why don't you log out and log back in, and hopefully you'll come back in unfrozen and we can continue the uh, nursery tour. Um, guys, I'm just going to text him really quick. <clears throat> okay, he knew. He logged out. <laughs> hey, Corey. Yeah, you joined at an odd time. You can go back and watch. Rob was touring us on his nursery, um, so he was live on his phone, and he got all frozen up. Oh, looks like Rob went back inside. Battery died. Hey, Rob, how's it going? My battery died on my phone. Oh, it died, huh? I thought I thought maybe it just went kaput. I used to run into that all the time when I was doing all my lives on my phone. It would just freeze up. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it would, like, get hot. Um, so, so let's just run through really quick. Let's kind of finish the nursery tour as you can kind of think of it. You were kind of coming around that corner right there after the greenhouse, what do you have going on over there that was on the left up against your house and then out there to the right? Because I don't think we covered the star. You got a bunch, star fruit, pineapple, figs. Like, why don't you uh, run through it? What else you got out there? A lot of new plants, uh, a lot of blackberries, blueberries, um, probably about eight or 10 different varieties of figs. And we're somewhere around 250 or 300 fig trees 
currently. Um, just just kind of a bunch of different edible. What what kind of figs? And um, why don't you give me some of the highlights on some of your favorite varieties and, and what what qualities you like best about them? Like why? Which? How many varieties of figs did you say? Uh, about eight. 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 So we have a couple of newer ones that are very small that we're experimenting with uh, as far as flavor. So I haven't tasted them yet. Uh, one is an Italian fig called Janeri. It's supposed to be the size of like a a tennis ball. Okay. Um, and then I've got a white tennis marker. ball, like a tennis ball. Tennis ball. That's incredible. Giant figs. Uh, I don't know how they taste, but you know they're Italian, so they they probably are good. Probably. The food snobs. Uh, we've got a white Marcel that are fairly new that haven't fruited yet. Uh, they're a French fig. Um, Magnolia, uh, beers, black, mission figs. Um, and what's your absolute favorite and why? Magnolia, best flavor. Uh, LSU purple, probably the hardiest. Okay. Hardiest how? Like what? Um, what are the problems people can expect from their figs? That this one stands out being hardy. Like what issues do they have? Typically nematodes. Nematodes. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any of your personal figs in the ground or are they all in pots? I have Celeste and LSU Purple in the ground. How are they doing? Both planted at the same time. LSU Purple is three times bigger. Really? So would you say possibly that that one is showing some nematode resistance? Because the, you know they're there. The Celeste? Poss uh -huh. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, so you pretty much, did you put them in, like, are they around each other? Or you just planted them at the same time? No, I planted them at the same time. They probably sit about 15 feet apart. I, I mean, are they, is one of them just a faster growing variety? Or do you think it is? Possibly nematodes. I mean, it could be faster growing. The the Celeste is supposed to be very resistant. Uh, it never had any rust issues, what a lot of the other figs have. And uh, are they producing for you? Yeah, both are producing. Um, and then, so, how, I'm sorry, can you repeat, how long ago did you put them in? Uh, it would be last year, the year before last. And how big were they when, when you put them in? Probably about a foot and a half tall. So yay big. And yep. how many figs are you getting off of them? When when is fig season? Do they all these different varieties do they produce at different times of year, or is there like a fig season that's just extended a little bit? It, it seems like there's a season that's maybe extended a little bit. Um, some of them have fruit on them that are starting to develop now. Okay. But I, I've never really seen them past summer. Past summer, like as in, so that's a that's a um, that's a loaded phrase here in Florida. Yes, it um, is. Like summer, as in June twentieth, summer. Probably or, like August. Or summer, like when our summer weather starts. Probably around August when I I've not seen them go any further than that. You haven't seen them go, so they do go into summer. Into summer, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so and you're saying they they have fruit on them now, um, so they're they so they're a producer of of. Spring, Jesus, it's not even spring yet. So they're a spring producer into summer. Right, right. Gotcha. Okay, okay. Um, okay. I'm just trying to, if people are watching this and they're new, what they can look for and expect out of their figs and know if they're if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. I gotcha. Um, that's why I'm asking these questions um, and playing dumb. No, I really am dumb. I know I don't grow figs. <laughs> I know nothing. About uh, I don't know anything about arugula, so you got me there. Right. <laughs> um, so what's the what's that uh, real popular one? I didn't hear you name it. The is it turkey? Uh, brown turkey. Brown turkey. I didn't hear you name that one. Do you not have it? And if you don't, why not? Because that's the one I always see at the store. I do, but there are so many other more interesting ones. Okay. I remember years and years ago, this guy was telling me about his figs. He had some figs that stayed green the whole time. They never changed color. 
Um, and the reason he liked them is because he had huge issues with squirrels and birds eating his figs. And they never knew they were ripe. And so they just left them alone. Right, right. And he'd go out there and pinch them to be able to tell when they were ready. And the birds never, never touched them. Right, yeah, because they, they tend to see the red spectrum in fruit better. Right, right. So they just stayed green. I don't even remember what kind that was, but do you have any that stay green like that? Yeah, Ischia. Ischia? That is what it was called. No, that is totally what it was called. I remembered as soon as you said that. Yep. So that's interesting. So if people are having an issue with, uh, oh, Jay York has an issue. Oh, he has an issue purple fig. Can you see the comments, Rob? Uh, yes. Okay, you're on your you're on your desktop now again. The I, phone died. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, I want to talk to you about blueberries. Um, like, I've talked to a few blueberry farmers, and their feeding schedule, I would say, is out of reach for most home gardeners. You know what I mean? Like it's over the top. I mean, as far as now, now granted they've got branches and you're, you too. I mean, I, I wouldn't say your feeding schedule is over the top. Um, but they were doing stuff like weekly, monthly running stuff through their system, going up and down the rows and, and fertigating, um, you know, and their branches were like falling over with, with fruit. Um, all the way to back when I had my blueberries and I didn't do anything with them. And I got, um, I've got 10 blueberry plants and during blueberry season, if I actually took care of them, we could probably get away with three or four blueberry plants and be happy. But I'd rather have more blueberry plants that take less work and get a little bit less blueberries off and just have more plants. Um, so you know, now I'm starting to kind of bump up what I'm doing. At first, I just neglected them for like the first two or three years, and we still got blueberries. I mean, like, I feel like it's, on the one hand, a relatively forgiving plant, because if you don't kill it, as long as you don't have it planted in like high pH soil, if you don't kill it, it gives you something. Yeah, sure. You know, if you're not killing it, almost like with strawberries, like if you don't kill your strawberry plant, even if you're doing it completely wrong, it gives you something. Yeah, you'll get a few. You know, and so so where I was all the way to where these professional, um, conventional, I should say, blueberry farmers, high production that I think is completely out of reach. Can you possibly, off the top of your head, give us a reasonable regimen for a home gardener for feeding their blueberries? Um, yeah, so I actually was just talking with Jay about this earlier, Jay York. Um, what I do is fertilize with granular three times a year. What right? month? The Well, the first, I kind of go by the what the plants look like. So the, the, ah. the first time I fertilize is right as they start setting flowers. Okay. Uh, then after that, I wait until after the fruit is done and we're getting ready to prune the plants back. So I will fertilize it cut all the plants back and then we're going to wait another two to three months and then we're going to fertilize it one more time for the year. So let me get an estimate. So that's around um, now. So February ish, March ish. Yep. yep. And then again, around probably middle May. May. Yeah. And then again in August. Correct. Okay. That's it, huh? That's it. You and on those one more time if you want, but uh, for us that seems to have worked fine. And then what are we talking? Those are like twenty five. You had plants at a bunch of different heights and ages, but they were all in the same size pot. Do you feed them all the same? Yeah. Yeah. And how and how much is that? So Rob buys an eight three five organic fertilizer from me that has, I believe. 4% calcium. No, that one, that stuff's higher on the, I'll have to look on my website, but it's got a, a good amount of calcium, magnesium, and sulfur in it right. as well. And so it's, this is an 835 super fine granular organic fertilizer. How much are you feeding of that per plant? 
Uh, we use about three quarters of a cup per plant. I'm I was doing half a cup by guessing, so <laughs> I wasn't that wasn't bad. Probably if I went a little heavy and made it a heaping cup, I was probably a little closer. So right. I might need to get out there and give those guys a little more food right now. Um, and then you are also doing liquid treatments, but I think you might be doing those a little more often than is manageable by your average home gardener, right? Um, we do. You're getting these plants to grow crazy fast. Yeah, right, right. So we do a compost tea um, that is brewed. Initially, when we started using it, we would put it down once a month through irrigation. Uh, at this stage, we do it about every three months. At this stage of the plant's life or at this stage of this year with them fruiting um, and flowering right now? With with the past uh, applications of it, I, I think we've built up um, a pretty heavy colony of microorganisms. Okay. And this is an aerobic compost tea that you make on site, right? Right, right. So that would be the equivalent of somebody grabbing some worm castings and um, – because I know you have a special brew that you do with the bags and stuff. But I'm just thinking for the home gardener, if they had a compost bin or good garden soil, they could, what, like put it, put it in a five-gallon bucket with bubblers or something? And do you add any molasses or is that kind of in your mix or what? No, no, we add a molasses as well. It's – um. Uh, you, you could probably put your worm castings in sort of like a tea bag with a with a string on it. You don't want all the the debris. You just want the the juice more or less from it. Uh, so we'll put that in and we'll let it soak for 24 hours, and then we'll turn the aerator on. At which point we will add molasses, and then that'll brew for another 24 hours, and then we we disperse it immediately. Uh, and how many gallons? I'm. Um, let's back up. How many plants you got again? Approximately. Oh, all together, uh, a couple of thousand. Couple what? A couple thousand. A couple thousand. Okay. And how many gallons of this uh, tea are you brewing to run through your system? Uh, I do thirty gallons of tea. Uh, probably could get away with ten. You could get away with 10 for the number of plants you have. Right. But the kits that we buy come in five gallon and then 30 gallons. So we just go 30. So if my math is correct, and please, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, if it's, it's been a long day. So if you had a thousand plants, but you said a couple thousand. Yeah, it's 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 based on a, a acreage. It's so much per acre. Right. So doesn't matter really how many plants you have. You can broadcast it over your entire yard. Well, a home gardener has a certain number of plants. I'm just – so that's 0 0.02 gallons per plant at 1,500 plants. Okay. 0 0.02, and that's um, eight times 0 0.02. Eight times 0 0.02. So that's like only 2.56 ounces of your tea. And then, because on your fertigator, you can set that at how many of your whatever you're adding per gallon, right? Is that how your fertigator puts out? Yeah, I want to say we set it to about one gallon of tea for every 250 gallons of water. One gallon of tea per 250 gallons of water. God, you're making me do a bunch of math, 128. I'm just trying to pare this down for the home gardener. Uh, I mean, a home gardener would get away with using probably two and a half gallons at the most, and they could spray their entire yard with it. So, uh, yeah, exactly. What I'm looking at is, is that right? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> So from what I'm looking at is they, per plant, they would need about two ounces of compost tea with about a half a gallon of water. That's, that was the math I just, guys, listen, I will sit down with Rob later on and try and do this and I'll post it in the comments. 
of what kind of I I mean that doesn't sound wrong to me. If, uh, if someone made up a compost tea and it was about and then they take about two ounces of compost tea, water it down with about a half a gallon of water, and that's what you pour on each plant. So I'll check that math, but that doesn't sound that off. You know, so if somebody's making a gallon of of compost tea or half a gallon, that sounds more reasonable for somebody who has like 10 plants. Oh, absolutely. More than that. Yeah. And they can make this out of homemade worm castings, stuff from their compost pile, because really what you're trying to do, right, Rob, is just brewing the biology that's active in good good compost or good worm castings, correct? Exactly. You're trying to make it grow. That's where the molasses comes in. Right. Do you ever add anything else like seaweed or kelp? No. Nope. Yeah, that, that's usually if you're trying to get also like a fungal-based tea, that's when you start playing with the alfalfas and the the seaweeds and stuff. I, I used to use just straight molasses. That's actually, you know, how I came up with my compost plus formula <laughs> is, is supposed to be kind of a bottled version of what you're doing plus nutrients for the plants. Right, right. But really what you're trying to do, because the blueberries, oh, let's cover that. Your soil for the blueberries. You're not just buying potting soil, right? And, and putting the blueberries in. Let's talk about the soil and why that's important. Okay. Yeah. No. So we use um, we use straight pine material. Uh, it's it's fifty percent pine fine, which is very small ground up pine nuggets. Uh, usually they're between three quarters of an inch to an inch, and then uh, the other half of the mix is one year composted pine fine. So the mix is one hundred percent pine, and the the pH is typically around four and a half to five at the highest. Now that's that, but that's pine bark finds, right? Not pine like pine. ground up two by fours. Right, right. Pine bark finds. I've had people ask this, and I've answered it guessingly. That's not even a word, but I've guessed and answered because <laughs> the pine finds are hard to find, right? They don't just have them at Home Depot. Can somebody buy a bag of just pine bark mulch, and if they have one of those mini leaf shredders can they just run that through there and and it's the same thing certainly uh okay. well, aside from the the composted portion of it yeah besides the fact that it's not composted and broken down which right. is why these microbes are good to put in that soil because it's kind of it's it's kind of void of that stuff right i mean it's not like regular compost right right and it'll accelerate the breakdown it'll accelerate the breakdown do you think maybe um uh, for some of mine that I've planted out in other gardens and they're doing great. I've for the same reasons, but because I didn't have time to go back and do a compost tea or my compost plus applications, I actually just mixed in about 10% of my 50-50 um, compost mix um, just to make sure that there was soil and biology in there so that the pine finds could start breaking down. I don't really feel like I added too much to bring the pH up too high, but um, I mean, I'm just guessing at this point um, because I think just growing in the pine finds and it not being like a soil is probably not a good idea either. Yeah, I think that's why a lot of folks are mixing with peat. Peat? Right. Um, to get well, so uh, some, of the farmers, some of the farmers I talk to who are doing what you're talking about, I mean, like, like I said, their feeding regimen is intense. And the fact that they're mixing it with peat, it's almost like um, they're almost like pseudo hydroponics. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Like, really, it, it's, it's hard. It would be a few more steps over this way, and they're hydroponic. Yeah, for sure. You know, because they got now they got all this peat in there. They've got. The pine finds, which really aren't broken down into a soil yet, they got their fertigation system and they're feeding every day, every day. They're and they're and they're doing foliar feeding, um, and so you know, and the and the granular uh, uh, soluble fertilizers. There's right. nothing going on in the soil. Right, right. Basically, um, at what pH are these blueberries looking for? Typically around four and a half. Four and a half. 
And our soil in Florida is what? Like, I mean, I know we have low pH soils in some spots, but it's like between seven and eight in some spots, isn't it? I would say so, yeah. yeah. So it's probably not a good idea for people to get your blueberries and take them home and put them in the ground, huh? Uh, no, no. Pot is definitely the best way to go, I would say. And and so you have these cool pots. I still haven't uh, bit the bullet. I have used the pots before, but not as far as transferring my blueberries into them. Because that just sounds like a nightmare. But um, tell us about these jackpots that you sell. Um, jackpots. So they're the they're the first fabric part pot that's that was introduced onto the the horticulture market. Um, they've been around for over thirty years. There's tons of of testing done on them, uh, made here in Florida. Uh, they they really accelerate plant growth by by allowing so much oxygen at the root zone um, it's almost impossible to overwater them as they dry out relatively good especially around the edges of the pots um, which is where in a plastic pot the so the water usually collects and it goes anaerobic right right and also your roots will spiral around in that zone as well because that's where all the water holds the water is, is saturated yeah. Uh, so, so the, the fabric pots will, will never give you spiraled roots either as the, the, the roots touch the edge of the pots, they, they die and you, you end up getting a lot of very fine hair root, uh, structure buildup that absorbs more water more easily than, you know, than the larger roots. Let me ask you this. Cause I know you've got, um, you know, you got a lot of different plants in your nursery, a lot of different sizes. Have you gotten plants in a smaller pot, transferred it into a smaller jackpot, and then had to transfer that to a larger jackpot at any point? Um, no, I mean, I, I take the, the blueberry plugs and I put them directly into a 30 gallon pot. Yeah, I know for your blueberries, you go straight into the big daddy, but like when, when you get say like a three gallon mango, have you had any situations where you've taken that three gallon mango out of a pot put it in a five gallon jackpot it didn't sell for eight months and you took it took from the five gallon to a seven gallon or ten gallon i'm just uh, wondering if you have any experience of pulling them out of the jackpot and putting them into something else no not yet um so so far i've taken those three gallon mango trees and dropped them into 30 gallon jackpots okay i've left them in those pots for two years and let them grow, you know, a, a, almost a two inch trunk diameter and then planted them in the ground. And, and then they go straight in the ground. They've done phenomenally. Uh, zero transplant shock. Um, just just as healthy as, as you can be. I mean, now, do, you, do you think that's kind of best practice to get the trees into the maximum size pot that they're going to be in? before they go in the ground, if they ever go in the ground as soon as possible? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a, a horticulturist, so I, I couldn't say. I could just tell you what I do. Okay. Is, it has seemed to work out pretty well. Um, you know, now, this year, we're starting to actually step up mangoes, avocados, uh, Barbados, cherry, figs, et cetera, into 15-gallon grow bags. Uh, that'll retail next year. And then it, I suspect if they don't sell next year, we would probably end up having to repot them. And I would say we'd go to 45. And then I, and so if you haven't done it yet, do you hypothesize that you're going to have to cut the jackpot off from? No, no, no. we can, we can peel them off. Get them out. No, yeah. I, I, we, you can peel them off and you can still reuse them again. Okay, cool. Yeah. And how much do those go for Rob on your website? Uh, so 15 gallon is about $8. Uh, 30 gallon is $10. Uh, we have 45, 65, 100 gallon, 200 gallon. Also. You have the 200 gallon one, which is like the size of a regular raised bed, right? Exactly. It's uh, 54 by 54 and stands about 16 inches tall. That's amazing. Uh, and you have one set up there with some stuff growing in it, don't you? What do you got? A bunch of like mint or... I have uh, I'm right to remember now, what you had in there. 
I've got six of them set up right now. Um, so we've got one that has longevity spinach, uh, one that has uh, Okinawa spinach. Uh, we've got one with turmeric, uh, one with ginger. And then I've got one that has some various herbs, uh, rosemary and uh, Cuban oregano. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you have your kind of grand opening. The heck? You have your grand opening event coming up. Um, it's sneaking up on me because I'm supposed to be there vending with you. Um, April, what is it? April 17th. April 17th. Hey, I have that day open. I wonder why. Um, I'm going to put that in my calendar right now so I don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> um, April 17th. And what is this event? Tell everybody what's going on. Um, where can they find you? How can they come out and, and check out your farm? Do they need to make an appointment? Are we still in that? Or is this open to everybody? Uh, well, the event is going to be open to everybody. Um, you know, we, we would ask that if you're, if you have any kind of symptoms to not come, but uh, it's going to be open to everybody. We're going to have uh, right around five or six different plant vendors, including you. Uh, basically, anything that you can grow in your garden and and eat, in most cases, uh, will be represented. Um, we've also got about 20 or so craft vendors. Uh, now, these are all local folks that create their own product and basically make money you know doing these type of events so no no mlm no mlm vendors no mlm vendors <laughs> good i don't like going to events or, or or vending at events with a bunch of mlm vendors right, sure. right. now <laughs> last year you know we attempted to do a, a more of a uh of kind of a visual type of uh, representation of all these vendors. So we were, we were actually given all of them half off if they were able to perform their craft on site. So uh, we had people that were signed up that would do wood turning and leather working, uh, knife making and all, all different things that they were gonna be, you know, doing visual demonstrations throughout the day. Uh, unfortunately, last year's event got canceled and right. this is gonna be a little bit different. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Are you gonna have your craft beer guys there this year? Uh, Are we not allowed to talk about that, or is that? I do not know, but I hope so. Okay. Um, and then um, are you firing up the grill? Absolutely. Absolutely. And what's on the menu this year you don't know yet? Uh, not 100% sure yet, but most likely it will be ribs, uh, pork loin, chicken, probably hot dogs, and who knows what else. Hey, do you have a, um, do you have a sauce vendor? sauce vendor like that makes barbecue sauces and salsas and so stuff like that uh no no uh maybe one of the canning vendors would do some of that kind of stuff but i'm not sure because it would be neat uh, uh, let me ask this one lady that i know makes sauces i think she's kind of in our mix that would be neat to use her sauces on your on your grilled stuff or do you already have am i am i i need to stay in my own lane because you got your own secret sauce I use seasoning on my food, so I would be offended if you put sauce on it. Okay, I will just back off. <laughs> <laughs> but you do you. You can do you. Um, so, you see it. so you got chicken, ribs. Is that what we're talking? Yep, chicken, ribs, pork. Um, we've got a huge smoker. It's the size of a trailer. Um, so everybody come on out. It's going to be a great day. There's going to be uh, lots of opportunities to get everything that you need for your um, for your garden and your yard. Lots and lots of knowledgeable people running around. Rob will be there. I will be there. Uh, other plant ben vendors will be there. Um, <laughs> are you reading these comments? <laughs> I wasn't, but I am now. And yes, I would like to make 300 a day. <laughs> a day working from home um so um so yeah rob's guys event coming up it is when april 17th 
April 17th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then um, you're expecting this to kick off because what was it last, the, not last year, but the year before that was the um, the U pick was a little light, right? How are you looking this year? Um, I mean, it will still be first come, first serve. We're still on a limited number of plants, so it, it is what it is. The event is, is going to be more focused around the crafts and the plants and okay, and, and spreading the knowledge. So, but I the U pick is going to be open or no? U pick will be open probably for a very short amount of time. And so if people want what, and what time does the U pick open when the event opens? Right. Right. When the event opens, you should, uh, you should open the U pick like two hours after the event. And we should have some sort of contest for people to get to U pick. Like we could, we could have like, you know, the airing of grievances and, um, like fight to the death. tug of war or something, mud fights, <laughs> a relay race. I don't know what, like they got to complete the obstacle course to get to the U pick. I'll take that up with my marketing people. <laughs> hey, we would have fun. Absolutely. <laughs> we need a jousting for sure. Jousting, that's great. What about strawberries? How are your strawberries doing? I know you were struggling a little bit with your gutters. Uh, so they're they're still alive. Okay. They are not really doing much work more than that though. They're they're just alive. Um, they're still they're just not really doing much. Anything else going on in the U pick? Um, or just the blueberries and focusing on the event? Uh, yeah, just the blueberries focusing on the event. Um, I would say if your only interest is to pick blueberries, to not come that day. Okay, so people might be that's this is important. People are really looking for the big, big U pick. Um, how many weeks, days after the event, you think it'll be really rocking and rolling? Should be going for about five to six weeks. Okay. Uh, and then it'll lead directly into blackberries. And that'll probably go for about five or six weeks as well. Do you have enough? I mean, I know you've talked about this. Do you have enough like peach trees and stuff producing that you can bring that into the fold of, of the U pick? Or is right now that stuff just for like personal use? No, you know, on, on a one-off basis, we've sampled the fruit with with folks that were interested in buying trees and stuff. But for the most part, they, they don't produce enough to do that. We only not have, enough, not consistently at least. Yeah, we only have six trees, and the window for picking is so so small uh, to to where you get that that perfect ripe peach. Uh, it, it's just too difficult to. Um, I can't understand how the the peach U picks are even functioning. I I think it's just those oh the 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 ones I've heard that are functioning really well are just a little further up north. I think a lot of these yeah. Central Florida to South Florida varieties that they've developed for us as great as they are, they're just so bipolar and all over the place. <laughs> um, and uh, you get different sizes, uh, different time spans, different amounts per tree. And kind of speaking on that, um, I've heard, I don't even want to get into the different ways of cutting the peach trees. I, I don't want to go down that that road today. Maybe we can talk talk more about it later. Maybe we could talk to people about it at the event. But um, the one thing I do want to bring up, have you experimented with, uh, like I've got some branches that have peaches on them back to back on the same stem or on the same side of the stem, but within an inch of each other. Have you gone on the, I just, in my mind, cannot imagine peach farmers sending people out into the field to pick two thirds of the peaches off the trees when they got little green things. But if that's what they do to get bigger, better peaches, or is that an old wives tale or what? It, it, I can't imagine them doing that. I think the manpower and the and the cost per peach would be so extravagant that it just doesn't make sense. No, no. Fiscally, there's no way that would work. I mean, out. I've got some branches that have literally peaches all over them right now. Yeah, right, right. And now I, I would thin them on my trees uh, in, when they, if they were grown in that fashion, but there's no way they're doing that on a commercial scale. So I'll report back this year. I'm doing some branches. Like I, I have two pre peach trees at my house. They're huge. I'm going to do one tree and the other tree I'm not going to do at all. Okay. Now I think the last time I saw that tree, it was covered in scale 
or something. It was something. I don't know what it was. It, it it went away. The ladybugs and other bugs showed up and ate whatever it was. It looked like a white powder. Yeah. I've never seen anything like that before. It came off in your hands. It almost looked like some weird mealy bug. I don't know what. It looked like someone covered my trees in baby powder, but it was moving. It was baby powder that was moving. Right. Might have been mealy bugs or or scale. like I, or 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 like billions of uh, really really tiny spider mites. Like I couldn't tell what the hell it was. No, I thought it was fungus, but if you looked close enough, it was moving. The cedar wax wings. Um, so I find that the more berries you have, the the less you really care about uh, birds coming in and taking a few. So you don't, speaking of that, you don't do anything like, do you got any plastic owls out there or do, no. you play, do you play music of like hawks screaming or anything like that? No, no. Um, we, we get an occasional uh, murder of crows that come in. You scare them off of fireworks. They're gone for months. Uh, so you actually do shoot fireworks off at them? Yeah, yeah. I'm, That's I'm, fun. I'm, if anybody is watching and didn't know, that's actually why fireworks are legal in Florida. That's it. And then when I check that box, when I buy them, I'm the only one probably telling the truth. He's the only one who means it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, you know, as much as I like um, in some of the gardens I'm doing and some of the food parks I'm doing, as much as I like planting a lot of diversity, there really is a beauty in kind of the orchard style planting. Oh, yeah. You know, like if you had all your plants and all your trees all over your whole yard, like all split up all over the place, it would be really hard to treat for this one problem or this one pest. Now, in theory, you would have less problems and pests with things kind of split up to confuse them. But, you know, like if you had all 50 peach trees and they're all next to each other, I think it's a lot easier to keep squirrels out of that than if you had 50 fruit trees spread out all over your property with bananas and everything else around them. So there really is a, it's kind of a give and take, but there really is a beauty in having the, the orchard style planting of kind of pushing everything up next to each other. Sure. Sure. I mean, I, I love the way it looks, but you know, and, and what we've experienced over the last four years of adding different trees uh, and different kinds of fruiting plants and vegetables and things that that our, our our pest situation has gone to almost nothing. Right. So you're not monocropping on your entire property. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have a diversity on your entire property, but you are somewhat grouping things together. You know, yeah, sort of. Uh, I mean, if you draw, go down our driveway, uh, you know, on the farm side, uh, you'll you'll see figs and then star fruit and then a couple of experiments that were running on pears and then peaches uh, and then you would go into uh, plums uh, japanese plums or loquats and then i have some citrus that are looking terrible yeah go figure so um so you brought up star fruit we forgot to mention star fruit you do stock star fruit how many kinds you got now right now none uh, oh I have a handful of them on order that are coming in at the end of March. Okay, March. So they'll be there for the event. They'll be here for the event, yeah. What size are they? Uh, three gallon. Three, three gallon. gallon? So yeah, typically between like three and five foot tall. And really with star fruit, I mean, this has been my experience, correct me if I'm wrong. Really with star fruit, you, the, with the multiple varieties, it really is just about flavor. They all pretty much do just as well as the other one, right? Um, I believe so. Yeah. I mean, there, there's subtle flavor differences from one to the next, but for the most part, you, one tree is going to produce more than any family could consume. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Barbados cherries earlier too. Um, I know there's a dwarf one because I have it in my yard and by dwarf, I mean, it's literally this big and the Barbados cherries on it are like this big. All tiny. Yeah. But I also heard there's another variety like of an actual variety you, are you familiar with that at all of two different varieties of the the big barbados cherries i i have not seen uh, i mean all the ones that i've gotten so far have been large fruit and larger leaves you know more like a tree or a shrub um 
I, I actually haven't come across any of the dwarf ones other than I have a, f a friend that has one in his yard. Well, no, I, I wasn't talking about the, I, I was, what I was saying was I'm not talking about the dwarf one. I'm talking about the big ones. I've heard there's two varieties. Two varieties of big ones? Yeah. And I just, I wasn't sure if that's a rumor. And uh, if it's not, did you know, is the difference, the growth habit? Is it the flavor? You know, um, like, I wish I knew. Um, you know, typically when they come in, it doesn't say anything on the tag. It just says Barbados cherry. Yeah. yeah. Like, like Florida peach. Mm. I've planted a few different ones in the yard. And so far from what I can tell, I mean, I've gotten them from different suppliers even. Um, so far from what I can tell, they're they're the same. Same thing. I, I assume that they air layer them and, and plant them out or root them from cuttings. Um, from what I understand, the seed is... Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to, to get them started with. I don't know anybody, or I have not talked to anybody who is able to do them by seed. Right. I've had a couple from seeds grow, but from what I understand, the um, the seeds within the fruit sort of uh, develop at different paces. So out of the three seeds you get, maybe only one is viable. Okay. Uh, you tried some seeds at one point, didn't you? I, yeah, I did try some, yeah. And did you get any of them to sprout? No. Yeah. No. All right. Well, Rob, I'm going to go through these questions, say hi to everybody, and then um, and then we'll wrap it up for the night. And if I don't talk to you, well, you need fertilizer, so I'll I be seeing this shortly. Okay, so we got Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Hello from Largo. Jay York, is this a joke? Yes, of course, Jay. It's always a joke. Kenny, thanks for watching, man. And Kenny says, love it. Thanks for coming on the show, Rob. Uh, Cindy says will the arugula get spicy with the upcoming heat yes arugula can totally grow over the summer but in my opinion it tastes like garbage i hate the spicy arugula some people love it to me the trick is is planting it by seed plants a lot of it and harvest it as baby arugula that'll help lay that down we already know paul's on and we said hi to him um let's see j j j Hello, Angela. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Rachel. And Jillian says our spinach is terrible. <laughs> this was a great year for spinach. We did amazing, but I believe it's over. Paul, uh, you the most plug of my air conditioning business. What's that? Paul says I like the pan of your truck. Yeah, yeah. You oh, did pan, yeah. you did pan your truck while you were out there. <laughs> because Rob doesn't isn't just a full time farmer. He also uh, does air conditioning. I know this is a little off topic, but we are talking about Rob today. He does great work. He redid my air conditioning at my house, and uh, it stays a lot cooler in here now. That is for sure. And we've saved a ton of money, by the way, Rob, on our electric bill. Fantastic. Yeah, it's already pretty much paid for itself. And what was that? A year and a half ago. A year and a half. Yeah, that's awesome. Um. Rachel said, where are you located, Rob? And then Jillian answered in Riverview. Um, Rob, what, let's see, I, I know, it's bobsberries.com, right? Uh, bobsberriesfl, as in florida.com. B-O-B-S-B-E-R-R-I-E-S-F-L? Yep. Bobsberriesfl.com. Now, some of you guys have commented about uh, lychee fruit, and I believe Jillian uh, had posted a farm in uh, Florida here that has a grove of lychee. I believe they're in production somewhere in the June time. I don't know if that's if that's right, Jillian. If she's it is. Let me tell you how I know that exactly when it is. So back when I sprayed lawns, um, I did this one customer uh, in South Tampa. And I did her lawn at the end of the month, every, every month. And the reason I know is because I went back through the logs to show her. And I was like, yeah, right here on June 26, I was at your house. And I wrote in the log, like, lychee, yum. Because I would, like, pick them all up on the ground and, and eat them from her tree. She said, this is how short the season is. She was like, oh, my God, we didn't. It's a huge. It was as big as an oak tree. And she was like, oh, my God, we didn't even know that that tree produced. And I was like, really? And she goes, yeah, we go out of town for five weeks every year in June, and we get back mid-July. Oh, damn. So, 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 like, literally, 
they thought this tree hadn't produced in like 10 years since they had been going on vacation. So in that small period of time, it put its flowers out, its fruit, fruited, the squirrels ate it all, and it was all gone by the time they got home. Oh, that's, that's just terrible. Now, I have a neighbor right down the street from me here in Seminole Heights who has three lychee trees that get loaded to the ground. I mean, the branches are hanging all the way to the ground every year. Yeah. So they do I, really well here. I just seriously thought the smaller ones couldn't take freezes that well. That's why I haven't been putting them in. Uh, well, I mean, that, that tree that I showed you earlier is sort of my, my personal, and I just decided to see what happens, so. I think that's I, I I mean like I would push that variety as a as a frost or freeze tolerant variety. Um, maybe just take note what side of the greenhouse that was sitting on, what how far away from the barn. Like there might have been a little bit of a microclimate there, but yeah, maybe a windbreak. But that's... maybe a windbreak. But I'd still I would still say with the temps we got this winter, if that thing was just sitting out there because it didn't have any kind of even cover over it right oh no no and it, it was, was just up against the greenhouse but the greenhouse was heated right yeah, barely barely i ran the heat maybe three times and then your barn is pretty tall and was what 20 feet away 30 feet away oh, maybe not even. it's probably like 10 feet 10 feet away so it was in between the two sort of in between the two yeah well that's that's good information but i would still say whatever that variety is i don't know if lychees in general are and i'm just wrong about that but I don't know, but next year I'm going to probably stick it in the middle of the yard and see what happens. And get more of those because I'm going to start pushing that. Okay. Okay. Um, Michael Thorne, thanks for tuning in. Rodent manure is the best fertilizer for lychee. Well, those two are compatible, right? Rodent manure. If you got if you got lychee trees, you're going to get rodents. Very true. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in, Rob. Thank you so much for joining me. You did great. It was really good to have you on. Um, everybody, please come out and see us on April 17th at 9 a.m., right? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Um, we'll be there. We'll be barbecuing. We'll be selling some stuff, talking about plants. Um, you get to see the farm. Hopefully, maybe pick some blueberries. Maybe not, but that's okay. should still be a really great day and uh, get you familiar with where his farm is located. And by the event, I believe Rob would have a pretty good idea of when his official you pick would really be getting kicking, right? Yes, yes. And there's a possibility, uh, albeit slim, that I may do like a pre-opening the weekend before the event. Um, just keep an eye on the Facebook page for that. Okay, and your Facebook page, they can find it by Bob's Berries on Facebook, right? Nothing special? Yeah, um, at Bob's Berries FL, same as the website, Bob's Berries. Okay, that's, that's pretty easy. Um, you on Instagram or anything or any other social media or just Facebook, or how else can people find you? Same on Instagram. Okay, same on Instagram. All right, well, great. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, whether you're or not you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, I just want to let everybody know that I am simulcasting this every week, Friday or Wednesday at 5.30 on Facebook and YouTube. So if you're on YouTube and you don't want to be and you can join us on Facebook or if you're on Facebook, this makes more sense and you don't want to be on Facebook anymore, you can join us on YouTube. We can still see your comments. Um, if you're watching this uh, recorded, not live, and you want to participate in my next um segment in some way or another, you can always email me garden questions to info at witwomorganics.com and I will bring up your garden questions live on the air and then you can re-watch it later to get the answers to your question. Or you can always um, go into the feed. I'm not sure if your feed's down here or over there or over there, but you can go into the, the comment section and post questions just make sure you tag Rob or myself if it's for us, if it's a question, because the chances of us going back and monitoring this later on are rare to slim. So just make sure you tag us or tag our business um, if you have questions on Facebook, and we'll try and respond in a timely fashion. Thank you so much, Rob. Have a good night, man. I will see you soon. All right, bud. Take care. Thanks for having me.